All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to episode seven, I believe, of our CICD pipeline journey. Uh, so last time we were talking about CML, right? I showed Jed some issues with the license. So I got that figured out with CML. It works now. It's fine. And then we got to the point of um, going and talking about Ansible, right? So Ansible will be our, our tool for doing configuration changes in the background uh, as part of our pipeline. So whenever we do a change, right, we will update a YAML file, the one that I was showing you for the two hosts for two NXOS switches. We'll update that, uh, do a git commit, git push, right? That will trigger the pipeline in GitLab and the pipeline, one of the components of that pipeline will be to perform the change that you've actually, you want to do with, uh, you know, creating a new loopback interface, reconfiguring your SPF, uh, right? Whatever the use case may be, but that will be performed that change in the background actually by Ansible in our uh, pipeline example here. So let's see, uh, we have any folks uh, it's only me there now. Uh, so, uh, let's get started where we left off last time. Let me close this. Um, this is something else. Uh, open up a new visual studio code, a new window, connect back to my VM. Let's see if it's running. Uh, what's the status here? And I want this new tab. 10, 2, 11, 55, 7. Let's see, can I log back in? And it looks like I can. Uh, there we go. So create environment. And before I do, anything let's go back connect here remotely remote explorer i want to connect back to my centos box uh, connecting current window bring the password the password, establish my remote connection with Visual Studio Code. Then we're gonna start exploring and let's do a git push, right, with the changes we've done. Uh, so let me go to the Explorer, open folder, that's okay. Okay, the password. And there we go. So, Uh, we were at the actions, that's where we left off, right? Is, uh, we have the host bars, folder with variables, configure SPF, right? And XOS interface. So all of these are variables, SPF process ID, router ID for each specific host. We have the two NXOS switches, 177, 178. Under group vars, we have um, the NXOS grouping of devices, which are my two NXOS switches. I have a username and password of Cisco Cisco. That requires, so these are all variables that we can use as we build our playbooks. Right, so let me go back and see our first playbook. It was configuring OSPF. We have our variables defined here. So under actions, next we'll go configure SPF. Let me see. Uh, to rename. Uh, or delete 
delete permanently. Yes, delete. Configure SPF. Okay, so in here I'll have a new file and we'll call it configure dash OSPF because we're going to configure SPF dot YML. So this will be our playbook, our Ansible playbook to configure OSPF. And I was telling you also we're in parallels. Let's change to source to CICD and we'll get status here. Uh, your branch is up to date with origin main. Uh, oh, because I'm making all the changes under the CICD Twitch. Okay. So I'll just copy this over. Uh, once I'm done with the changes, I'll put them from the CICD Twitch, which I'm going to do a git push going to github.com so that you folks can clone that repo and you know follow up with exactly what we've done here. So at the end of the stream today, I'll just do a git push to github.com with all the changes we've performed over the past couple of weeks. And then I'll move also stuff from here that we've changed to the CICD folder so that also my repo here, right in my local GitLab, will get the updates and all the latest files. All right, so uh, configure OSPF, right? This will be our Ansible playbook that will configure OSPF on those two switches. We have our host bars, we have our group bars. Let's start using those variables that we've defined in those folders for the two Nexus switches. So I'm going to start as usual at the top with three dashes. And then I'm going to have the first task as part of my playlist, right? Would be to remove the OSPF ROS from the interface, right? So I'm going to make sure that I remove OSPF and then reapply it again because if there's any changes that I've done uh, to the IP address on an interface or OSPF process ID or whatever it is or the area on one interface I change it from one uh, area ID to a different one uh, I just want to remove that before with the playbook remove the configuration and apply the new one that's part of my YAML definition files from from here, right? So the host that I'm, uh, the name of the task in my playbook is to unconfigure interfaces and remove SPF. So the hosts are gonna be the NXOS hosts from the group vars, right? Um, variable Ansible connection will be network CLI. So I'm gonna connect through Telnet, right? uh to my switches with that cisco cisco username and password and then the tasks for this first uh, item in my playbook is to remove ospf ROS from the interface i'm looping through configure ospf so this is a variable that i'm getting from here right so configure spf from my host bars from my 10 10 10 177 and 178 so it's gonna go and loop through each item, each of the interfaces defined here. And I'm gonna use an XOS module, the NXOS interface underscore OSPF, right? And then the interface would be from that loop, right? So NXOS OSPF interface taken from there, the item, so it will be basically populated with loopback zero, loopback zero, OSPF and area, uh, interface, OSPF and area, and you will get state absent, which means remove the configuration from there, right? 
uh, that was this state apps and is remove the configuration for each of the items in this uh, configure that underscore OSPF object, go through each interface and remove um, the OSPF uh, configuration and the area ID. So now to get a bit more, how can we find out more information about this module? So if you go Ansible Cisco NX OS, uh, collection now they call it module uh, so if I go here and I do all these modules right are configuration modules for OSPF so in our case we have NXOS underscore interface OSPF so I have NXOS underscore inter interface OSPF. NXOS interface OSPF. Let me see. NXOS interfaces module. It says it in here. Um, interfaces enabled through uh, so it, that's basically you're doing a no shutdown when you enable true, right? You see enabled false, that means it's just shut down. Um, but it's not here. Let's see where that module is and what version 2.9.10 or newer. What about OSPF? NXOS OSPF interfaces OSPF v2 v3. So let's see this. OSPF interfaces module. Um, so these are basically all the options that you can pass in to configure OSPF, right? So let's see an example. NXOS OSPF interfaces. In my playbook, NXOS underscore interface underscore OSPF. Seems that they might have changed this in this module I'm using here a bit of an older module Ansible module for this so in the latest version they might have changed this NXOS underscore SPF underscore interfaces so that's you know a breaking change right so if you've built your Ansible playbooks the way I'm building them here using NXOS underscore interface underscore SPF, right? And then Ansible decides to rename the modules in the new version of Ansible and do it NXOS underscore OSPF underscore interfaces. So that would cause issues, right? Because your playbooks now will not know what module to use because they've been renamed. Uh, so we'll see, I'm going to keep my module and the way I've defined the playbook and we're going to use, even if we use a, an older version of Ansible and I'll show you that possibly today, maybe in next week on how to actually build the Docker image with Ansible that will be used as part of the pipeline, but we'll get there in a bit. So, right, this is a breaking change. You would have to rewrite all your Ansible playbooks and that's one of the one of the issues with Ansible because if they keep changing the module names and then you build your playbooks with a certain naming convention and cert using certain module names and then they change them and then you have to refactor and you do your fix your playbooks so it's a you know uh, 
uh, always a race of figuring it out. What now, what breaking changes did they do with this new version? Uh, so let's go next. This is the interfaces, right? Configuration wise, pretty much the same. So you have the name here, um, the module that is being used and the config, the name of the interface, address family would be you know, IPv4 in here, process ID area, uh, in case if it's a multi area and then IPv6 configuration, the process ID of 200, area ID, right? You would have your, your regular OSPF options uh, configuring your interfaces. So, but for us, first step here, I'm connecting to the NXOS switches, right? Through the network CLI, uh, using Telnet, that Cisco, Cisco is my password. I'm connecting to 177, 178, my two Nexus switches. I'm looping to that configure OSPF, which is right here. I have four items right now, four interfaces that are configured for SPF. So I'm going well, each one of them, right? I'm looping to one uh, to all the interfaces and I'm removing the OSPF and area with this, uh, with this task, first task as my, uh, of my playbook. Next. I'm gonna go and configure OSPF on all the interfaces. All right. So I'm gonna go here. And we'll have a playbook to configure interfaces for SPF. So there's a couple of tasks in here. The same hosts, I'm targeting the NXOS grouping of hosts, which are my two access switches. The variables of the NSPL connection is still network CLI. And then the tasks are to configure the OSPF process ID, area ID and router ID. So I'm gonna use the NXOS underscore config to pass in uh, CLI configuration commands. Let's have a look at this one. So NXOS underscore config is it in here. Uh, NXOS config module. So this NXOS underscore config at least stays the same naming and let's see an example. You can configure access lists, right? Um, what else examples they have here? Uh, shut, no shut, shut down an interface. Right, so this module will be used basically to pass in CLI commands uh, to your device. So we're passing in the router ID under the router OSPF process. Uh, so OSPF process ID. Uh, so it's removed first and then we re-edit router OSPF process ID and then we configure the router ID, which is taken from here, OSPF process ID and router ID from my host virus file. Um, so these are getting populated in my playbook right here. Uh, then I'm creating the interface, right? So NXOS interfaces module. Uh, I'm getting the NXOS OSPF interface I'm doing a description. So this interface has been configured by Ansible so that I know that it's been a change that Ansible has performed. The interface is enabled. Um, 
So if I look at this module, right, and XOS interfaces, could it go back here? And it's an XOS interfaces. We've had a look at this. So this would be enabling the interface, right? Doing a no shot, uh, basically on it and adding this description. Hey, the interface has been configured by Xbox so that I know once I go and I check that the change has been done by my, my CICD pipeline using Ansible. All right, next, I'm gonna set the IP before address on the interface, right? So um, I'm config, I'm looping over that configure or SPF, going each interface at a time. And I'm making sure that I'm configuring the IPv4, uh, IPv4 address would be basically the NXOS IP variable from here. So NXOS IP right here will be configured on each of these interfaces uh, one at a time as I'm looping through them. And then adding the OSPF route. So adding the OSPF configuration to the interface. Same thing, I'm gonna loop to that configure underscore OSPF using the NXOS underscore interface underscore SPF module that's been renamed. Um, I'm going through the interface, right? OSPF area and making sure that it's present. So that's my playbook for OSPF configuration. I remove, I do a cleanup at the beginning, going through all those interfaces from my host bars, remove the config, right? And then just reapply uh, all the new configuration changes for all the interfaces that are part of this configure underscore OSPF group. So host bars, right, would be one of the paths that Ansible looks by default for variable definitions. They have, you know, uh, I was talking uh, with my colleague Quinn Snyder a while back about, you know, Ansible has like more than 20 locations, right? Paths that it looks under for variable definitions. So it gets confusing. That's another thing with Ansible that it can get very confusing to troubleshoot because you can have these variable definitions in several different places. And if you have the same name for them, right? So if I would have here, I have my host bars 10, 10, 10, 177, and I have variables defined in here. Well, if I have the same variable names defined somewhere else in my group vars or a different path where Ansible checks for variable definitions, you could run into trouble because it's like, okay, right? You have the same uh, variable name with possibly different values for each one of them. So it's like, okay, which one's gonna take precedence and which one is gonna be used as part of my playbook. So you have to start looking into um, a verbose output when you run your playbook to see you know, what exactly is happening and where it's getting the value for the variable that, that it's getting. So in our case, we have our, um, configure OSPF.yaml, right? So this will be our playbook, removing, then adding the router ID on the interface, uh, on the router ID process, sorry. So it starts a router OSPF, uh, and the process ID is one. So it will basically propagate this OSPF process ID variable with the value of one. So it will run router SPF one and under router SPF one, the router ID will get populated with the router ID from here. 
right? 192.168.0.1. So that would be the router ID for my Nexus switch one. And 192, 168.0.2 would be the router ID for my second Nexus switch. And then I'm configuring the interface, right? Uh, I'm enabling it, so I'm doing a no shutdown and I'm adding a description. So this interface that's being uh, taken from my host bars again, or a spare interface has been configured by Ansible. You can add whatever um, comment you wanna add here in the description of the interface so that you know that this has been performed, the change that's done by Ansible via your CI CD pipeline. Then you have your set interface IPv4 address, configuring the IPv4 address that's getting pulled from my host bars also, and then OSPF configuration with OSPF um, number, and then the OSPF area. And then the IPv4 address right here. So nothing too fancy. Let me save this. Right, we have our Ansible playbook. We have our group vars, our host vars, we have our ansible.cfg, right? So we're kinda, let me see if there's anything we're missing. We're kinda ready on the Ansible configuration. Um, that should kind of be it, right? So let me go now and do a git push. Let's see if I go up, we're gonna do a git commit and git push to make sure we get it into a GitHub so that you folks can have access to this at home. Uh, I'm gonna sign in. I'm gonna sign in off screen here. Uh, let me get my authentication. Uh, GitHub. So I'm authenticated and we have this CICD Twitch and two weeks ago. So let's bring this up to date with all the changes we've done. So I'm in CICD Twitch. If I do a git status here, I should see that I have the hosts. Actually, yes, I have the host too defined here with that NXOS grouping. 10, 10, 10, 177, 178. So that's my NXOS host that uh, are getting propagated and populated as variables. And then I have my actions, and then I have my ansible.cfg, group bars, and host bars. So this is basically my ansible configuration. So if I do a git add everything, a git status one more time, Okay, so they've been added. I do a git commit with the message of added the Ansible playbook and variables. Ansible playbook for OSPF configuration. Okay, and if I do a git push now, let's see if it's gonna ask me to authenticate. No, it has it cached uh, with Visual Studio Code. 
so my status now I'm up to date if I go back here I refresh my CICD twitch there we go last week so there might be a problem again with the time <laughs> if you folks remember uh, might jump into actually trying to fix this issue now because you might run into this also so let me see date is may 18th so again on my centos 9 box it's like six day be six days behind right so this is a problem um and let's try to fix it um because this is going to come back right and it's going to bother us every single time for i mean as if you don't use the vm for a while and if you pause it or stop it or you know suspend it whatever you want to do then and you uh, bring it back online after a while it seems that it doesn't pick up the time automatically uh, the current time so a solution would be just to make sure that ntp is working on it right so ntp is network time protocol if you're not aware, networking folks usually are aware because NTP is a fairly critical component. But anyway, if you're not familiar, NTP is a protocol that's been developed for synchronizing time between devices on the network. And you get your, you know, quartz crystal enabled time servers right that are extremely exact so those or you know like your satellite clocks that your satellites are synchronized and they're extremely precise so those would be your what what's called the stratum zero ntp server so those are the most accurate time sources that we have right it's a um, it's interesting how they keep track of time, right? Because you would think, right, it's just time. But once you start looking into extremely precise timekeeping and you'll see that it's it gets gnarly and get into a, you know, like a rabbit hole that keeps going and gets more and more complicated. But for us, I'm just going to keep it stratum zero right would be your most uh your most accurate time sources so those would be the ones that you would want to sync up to that's the ones you want to get your time from and those as they propagate time to set different servers using ntp and this protocol right and exchanging data between them so as you have devices enabled for ntp they will start exchange NTP packets between them, right? And data, and they will start communicating. It's like, okay, what's the time? The, the, the client will ask the server, right? What's the time? The server will tell you the time. So this is, you know, the time exactly now. And then they'll see also the difference that it takes for the packet to go from the client to the server. So you have to keep in mind that, you know, there's whatever, 150 milliseconds, depending on how far you are from the server, um, you get into a discussion about, you know, it's gonna take me 30 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds, or, you know, maybe 300 if it's a time server that's far away. So you have to keep in mind the jitter and the delay between your client and server especially when you start calculating time because it takes like i said a certain number of milliseconds for the client to talk and get back the package and the messages from the server so that's all kind of built in into ntp so you don't need to worry about that but what you need to worry about is enabling ntp and making sure you find a list of ntp servers that you can you know sync up with so I was telling you about stratum zero, most precise ones. Stratum one would be the group of servers that get time updates from a, a stratum zero type of server, right? And type of NTP server. 
And then as you go down, Stratum 2 would be a group of servers that get updates from a Stratum 1, right? So they're not as precise as a Stratum 1 or a Stratum 0, but they're still fairly precise within reason. And then as you go down, Stratum 3, 4, 5, right? Uh, you would have these servers in a, in a hierarchical structure with Stratum 0 at the top, most precise, Stratum 1, you know, precise, but a bit less. And um, as you go down, they'll be um, less precise in time. And then a stratum of 16 would basically show you that, you know, usually that you don't have any synchronization or there's a problem uh, or that's just a source of time that's not really to be trusted or believable. So that's kind of to, to signify that, hey, um, you're time source if it has a stratum of 16 you might not want to want to um to get your data or your time from from that source so let's see now we have a centos 9 box right uh date is messed up here a bit so if i do a history life specific remembers grab date on how we set it if you folks remember we've said this before but now let's try and see if we can um, figure out this and get NTP working uh, and update it automatically so we don't have to worry about this every time I suspend this, uh, my VM. Okay, so let's look it into it, CentOS. I don't have any questions. Let me just check in the chat. Uh, I see some folks in there. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining the stream, by the way. Um, I don't see any questions. So we'll just keep going and I'll look here. CentOS 9 NTP client. Let's start with that. Configure NTP client on a CentOS stream 9. Uh, okay, so NTP client configuration is mostly the same with the servers. However, NTP clients do not need to receive time stream requests from other hosts, so it does not need to specify the line allow. Right, it's just a client, it's not gonna be a server for us. We're not gonna provide time to anyone else with this CentOS uh, 9 box. Okay, so we're gonna have a install crony and then uh, pull enable and then sources. To install NTP status, it's possible to display time synchronization status. Okay, so let's give this one a try. And we might already have Crony installed. Let's look. Uh, sudo. And then crony package crony is already installed all right now if I go and see the config crony.conf Uh, pull so it has um, pool of resources here configured uh, to centos dot pull so we'll leave, leave this one but we'll also add the pool over here SRV dot world I burst. So basically specify a pool of servers, right? Normally this dlp.srv.world would resolve, would be load balanced, a DNS load balancing mechanism in which you have it pointing to several different IP addresses, right? So as you start asking the servers, resolving the name to an IP address, it will resolve to several different ones. So you could uh, have access to more is, you know, you don't necessarily want to point only to one server that one goes down or something happens with it and, you know, you lose your um, 
your time synchronization. So you usually specify a, a DNS load balancing mechanism here, specify a name, and then the outburst is basically just to connect to, um, let's see what outburst actually means. So if I do a man crony, no manual entry for crony. Um, what does it mean? I burst NTP I burst example burst and I burst from info blocks. Uh, burst for initially and quickly calibrating a system clock, right? So you wanna, because by default, NTP takes quite a bit of time and it takes actually quite a bit of time. The, the bigger the difference in time is from the actual time uh, and the time you have configured on your uh, server or your network device, the bigger the distance. So in our case, it's six days, right? That's a big difference compared to what actually we have. So NTP by default is not gonna just go and trust blindly, right? That the server that you configure is like, yes, this is it, right? I'm just gonna change automatically quickly my time to the time that the server is telling me that that's the time. So I have a difference of six days, right? Um, and I'm just gonna quickly change it because that could introduce breaking changes you know, at the same time, if the server is misconfigured or your server is misconfigured. So what NTP does is that it's, it's taking its time, pun intended here, <laughs> uh, right? It's taking its time to synchronize. So the bigger the difference between the time that it has and the time that it has to synchronize to, the longer it's gonna take to, to bring it up to that, you know, time that the server, it tells it that it is. So it's gonna take a while, it's like, hey, what's the time? So, oh, really? It's really, I'm really that far behind. Let me, you know, update my time by, you know, half an hour or an hour or maybe half a day. What time is it? Oh, really? I'm really that far behind. So it goes and slowly catches up and it could take quite a bit of time. So then with the eye burst, you're telling it, hey, just, you know, go get the time. I believe that this is the right source. Um, don't be too concerned about it. Just burst it and, and get a time. Uh, all right. And then let's enable it. Let's enable crony and will be system CTL, right? Enable. Uh, enable. Now, crony D. Crony D. All right. And then crony C sources. All right, there we go. So we have some sources here. Uh, triton.ellipse and if I go and check this let me see if I ping uh, this what is it going to resolve to Okay, so resolve to NS SRV dot world. Can do ping, which is fine. Um, they might have blocked ICMP request, which makes sense. It's, it's okay. Just wanted to see what it resolves to. Right, so it's actually just resolving to their name server, the DNS server. Okay, so I have my sources, right? And now let's see if I check date, it's still behind. 
and let me start install that NTP stat also. Do I have NTP stat now? Yes, I want to install it. Proceed with changes. Yes. Downloading packages. Uh, so it's synchronized to NTP server 198 at stratum 3, time correct to within polling server every 256 seconds. So that's like what? A bit more than four minutes, right? It's polling and it's synchronized to this NTP server, which is one of these ones here in the list. Um, and you, t you see time correct to within, this is huge. <laughs> So it's, it's not, but as you see, right, I was telling you, it slowly picks up and it's slowly going to bring it up to day. So that I burst, it's not really bursting right away, but it's trying to burst of eight packets when the server is reachable and is used to accurately measure jitter uh, with long pole intervals and then our burst sends a burst of eight packets when the server is unreachable and then shorten the time until the first sync we specify NTP burst for faster clock synchronization so that's what you wanted this option is considered aggressive by some public NTP servers. Is the NTP server is unresponsive. The iBurst mode continues to send frequent queries until the server responds and time synchronization starts. So right, we want to synchronize a bit faster than the usual than the default behavior of NTP. And you see here it's slowly getting better. So this value keeps going down. Right, and now polling interval went to 512. This might be not seconds, but maybe microseconds. So you'll see this getting down, right? The value of 260, 45, 44, 9, 44, 8, 44, 7 milliseconds. So that's the difference between what it's my server, my NTP server is telling me here, which is it has a stratum of three, right? So it's, it's not bad, stratum of three is good. Uh, so my server, if I want to provide time at my own turn, I mean, this, with this CentOS 9 server, um, if I wanna provide time to some clients downstream from me, uh, then it will be, a, you know, my server will be a stratum four, and my clients at their own turn, if they would want to take time from me, get time from me, time updates and propagate it downstream, there will be a stream of five and so on and so forth. But this is going to take a bit of time. And it's because just it's so much, the difference is so, uh, so much between the actual, it's like what, six days, like I was saying. So it's going to take a bit of time for it to get from four, what is this? 530 million milliseconds delay between, uh, so that's roughly six days, it almost looks like, uh, 530 million milliseconds. Um, so once it picks up, right, we want it to be somewhere between 10, 11 milliseconds, the lower the difference between your server and um, or your client and the NTP server, the better, the more accurate your time will be. Um, all right, so this hopefully will fix the time for us eventually. It will pick up, right? It will get there by next week. 
uh, and I'll we'll check to see that time has uh, actually been updated and it's up to date and it stays up to date. Um, other thing that I wanted to make sure we have is uh, CentOS 9 start crowing. Crony service, start crony service, every reboot. Uh, let's see this link. because accurate timekeeping is one of the most important configurations required. I agree, configure crony as an NTP client. Yes, server uh, restart. Check the NTP sources and confirm that the system class is synchronous correctly to the AppStream time server. Uh, let's see those. Crony sources, we have them in there. Uh, configure Crony as an NTP server. Uh, wrap up so you can configure to, to, to check out. So I don't know if system CTL actually uh, reboots them automatically. Uh, don't think it does. Uh, how to sing time in CentOS 9 using crony. Let's see this. How to install and use crony. Uh, start and enable the service. Let me see this one. Crony NTP features install, set the time zone update your system, install crony, start enable status, um, configure crony NTP server. So the list of servers allowing, so this is to act as a, um, as a server, as an NTP server. I only have it running as a client right now. Uh, install crony on your client, enable, restart. So as shown above. Okay, so what about here? Uh, Testing crony, start enable, verify synchronization. We've done that. Crony sources, we've done that. Check crony sources stats. Oh, what it means number of sample per minute, number of residual runs, uh, estimated offset of the samples. It's the last value. So here, 42 milliseconds, this is the time I was telling you that it takes, right, for the packets to get to the server and back. So it calculates, my best one would be 10 milliseconds. Yeah, so that's not bad. Um, and let's see, NTP stat, it's still at 40, 530 million, <laughs> but it's going down. By next week, we'll be up to date. Uh, so this, uh, how to configure Linux to start automatically. Let's see this. Digital Ocean 2021. System D. Uh, server management daemon. Uh, run levels. Yes. To enable to start the system boot time, run this command. Okay. There we go. Upstart daemon. No, it's just check config crony on. Let's do that. So I'll do chk config 
crony d on yes uh, yes proceed with changes on install that system tool for maintaining uh, at crc testing packages forwarding request to systems here crony this service System CTL enable crony D. Okay. Service. Status. Okay. So it's loaded. It's active, running. Um, process ID, tasks, memory, CPU, crony D. Okay. Redirect. Uh, upstart daemon. We're not going to use that. System D daemon, directory structure. Uh, dependencies. Start a process. System CTL show. Um, upstart and system D service management demons. Okay, so I'm gonna let this run. Uh, Crony D get my time up to date. Right, I'll check to see later today um, but for today we've kind of finalized ansible we have our hosts definition ansible config host vars group vars we have our playbook using the variables defined in these two folders uh, we've pushed it to github.com so you can have access to this uh, to all the work that we've done so far we've fixed ntp uh, I'm going to check that it gets up to date and make sure that crony D runs even after you reboot the CentOS machine, right? Um, so we're going to be checking on that uh, this week. Make sure that we have it for next time. And um, with that, next time we're going to pick up and we're going to talk about Docker and how to build a Docker image for your CSD pipeline having you know ansible and pyts mainly as two components that will be part of our pipeline so the docker container will have all the pre-required tools to run the stages of your pipeline so hope to see you on the next one um we'll cover docker show you how to build the image and show you how to have ansible and pyts as part of that image and also how to have it on um, on docker hub how to upload your image there and how to keep track of it and um, possibly we'll also get started on pyts next week but docker first and foremost i'm glad with the progress we made this week we got ansible uh pre-packaged and running we have our configuring our spf for our two switches so uh we're in a good spot next week docker thanks everyone thank you for joining thanks for watching this hope you find it useful see you on the next one take care everyone bye